Sure, thanks for joining. We're just waiting for more people to get in the room before we start. There we go. Uh, so good afternoon. Um, my name is John Robinson. I'm the moderator of uh, today's discussion. Um, uh, we've got a really uh, compelling topic uh, that we're going to discuss today, disaster resilience and emergency response. Um, this is a topic that um, we wanted, we've been wanting to do a long time um, uh, for three reasons. Um, number one, Mazarin Ventures, the, the venture fund that I'm a partner in. Um, we love backing entrepreneurs before the world believes in what they're doing. And we've got um, a panel of entrepreneurs on this uh, repartee discussion that have a vision for the world that, that is backable. Number two, um, Mazarin Ventures, we uh, invest alongside a syndicate of other investors that are increasingly, increasingly keen to do social environmental impact investing. It's a growing space, it's not new, but in the last year or two, the social impact space has become um, really compelling. So there's a lot of interest in this topic. And, uh, and lastly, um, there's, there's, there's sort of a community um, being created within the space. Uh, Richard Seeline uh, in Houston um, has launched something called the Resiliency Innovation Hub. Um, and he has a fund tied to that. It's really exciting that um, he's, he's organizing thought leaders in, in resiliency. Um, and so we thought that we would contribute a verse uh, to the discussion by getting some entrepreneurial people together and talking about um, a disaster response and uh, uh, disaster resilience and emergency response. The agenda today is a pretty loose conversation. Um, we don't have any PowerPoints. And you will, by the end of the hour, you'll hear from uh, these six individuals about what they're doing, why they're doing it, and, and ways to partner. Uh, let's just go around the table really quickly and, and do quick introductions. Jasmine, you want to begin? Of course. Knew I was going to pick on you first. <laughs> Absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Jasmine Cheen. I am the founder of Reconnect, um, and I recently graduated from MIT um, in the program of Design, Engineering, and Management. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm sure we have a lot more to share after. Jesse? Thanks for having us. Um, Jesse Levin, I'm the founder of an organization called Tactivate. Uh, we launch businesses hand to hand with special operations veterans and then fund international disaster response and economic stability efforts uh, around the world. Cool. Julia? I'm, uh, hi, I'm Julia. I'm the CEO and founder of IC Change. Uh, we're a data platform where local leaders, engineers, and the public build solutions together. Great. Uh, Aline? Hi, everyone. Aline Guidry here. I'm the director of EOS Ops for All Hands and Hearts. We are a disaster relief organization that helps communities impacted by natural disasters all over the world. Great. Good to have you here, Aline. Uh, Kevin? Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Sofin. I wear a few hats. Uh, I am a full-time employee of a company called WS Darling Company that has deep roots in first responders and military supply. Um, and in the past year and a half, two years, I'm a co-founder of an organization called Box of Rain that works with different partners to help bring safe water to those that need it when they need it. Great. Thanks, Kevin. And then John Robinson, partner at Mazarin Ventures. We're social environmental impact investors. And we have a, a big focus on disaster uh, resilience and emergency response and technologies that enable that to happen. Uh, uh, Julia, I want to start with you. Um, tell me a little bit about the problem that your organization, what, tell us again for the people who came a little bit late, what your organization's name is. And, and you woke up one day and you decided I wanted to go after X problem. What is it? Yeah, so um, so I, again, I, I, we are IC Change. Uh, we have you know, come, I come from a background of being a climate science reporter. So for over a decade, I saw um, top-down solutions being mismatched to local needs. And those were expensive mistakes. Those cost people lives. And really, there's a communication gap when it comes to the people who are impacted and seeing these climate impacts firsthand and the solutions that are being designed when they're not in the room. So when it comes to flood event, heat event, drought event, it's farmers, people who are low income, people who live in very um, frontline communities are not in the room because uh, they're the most impacted. They have the most data and insights to offer to, to making solutions, but they're the least likely to participate in public processes. 
And what we found is, you know, when these infrastructure, multi-million dollar infrastructure projects are designed, whether it's for water infrastructure or for transit, any major design, um, they're using data models, uh, flood models, heat models, you know, transit models. And those models are inaccurate, um, particularly when it comes to climate impacts. Uh, if you think of how we're modeling global climate change, as you narrow down and downscale, you're making more and more errors. So what we found with our solution is that when community members are brought into the conversation, we actually deputize them to take pictures, take measurements, dialogue on the, on the solutions. We actually improve the designs. We actually can validate and fact check the models and often they're wrong and then we correct them. And then we've saved hundreds of thousands of dollars to our clients who are largely engineering firms uh, and municipal clients. We're looking at working with utilities uh, this year um, and added impact. So in some of the multi-million dollar infrastructure projects we've worked on where we've used our platform, which is a, a crowdsource platform, we've uh, expanded uh, local water infrastructure and flooding mitigation projects by $6 million uh, and reallocated those to lower income neighborhoods who are going to get the most benefit. So it's an incredible in innovation around process um, and also around data. So you so it's a it's a citizen science a community science play at the heart of it. It's lever it's 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 liberating the data from people who live on the front lines, and bringing it up into bigger models. Yeah, some people call it citizen science. Again, I come from a media background, so people call it citizen journalism. I actually think of this more as twenty first century citizenship. We need to really involve communities in these decisions because it saves money and it saves lives. It. And even the language that people use, in, you know, in addition to the data they're collecting on the ground, mm -hmm. we can analyze patterns in language. We can understand language as data. And it's that much more powerful when you pair it with external modeling or, you know, measurements that they're taking. And so, Julie, what's your, because um, you said it really quickly, what's your website again for everybody? It's uh, ICchange.org. Uh, we still have the ORG at the end of the URL, even though we're a for-profit company. I just want to make sure that if people want to dig in, they can go further. Um, you know, Jasmine, because your organization is doing so much prep for uh, disasters and emergencies, tell us a little bit about the problem you're solving in this process. Yeah, and as I hear Julia talk about the organization, there are just so many parallels and, and the challenges that we're seeing in the disaster response and recovery, we see two worlds. One is what the community experience and the stories that they have and versus what we see on TV of the official stories that um, that people hear and, and, and are told. And so I, um, I was connected with um, Puerto Rico and, and I love the island and months later, Hurricane Maria happened. And as you know, that um, um, the hurricane changed the face of the island forever. And, and what I learned is that for months, the residents did not have access to essential supplies for a long time. And on the other hand, the philanthropy and the donations are coming, but they didn't really have the connection or understanding or the information about where the help should be sent, nor do they have the, the human resource, the, the connection to say that you have a bunch of food and water coming to San Juan, but don't, you don't really have the truckers or the, the, the residents to bring it to the grandma in um, Utuado where they really need to have that, that resource. And, and while communities on the other hand, that they've really risen from the devastation and organized themselves into grassroots organizations, they're cooking meals for each other. Um, they are cleaning the streets and they are mapping their own um, communities and who is living in a situation where they don't have families or who um, um, needs food and the, the people who are bedridden. And, but the two worlds are not connecting. And so what we are doing is um, a civic tech um, solution, RE plus connect is to first, we'll wanna bring everybody on the same platform. People get to know each other, how, um, the big donors are doing things and what the community groups are doing things. And, and then we want to use a platform to help community groups to be able to understand and tell their own stories, exactly like what Julia said of, of what they are seeing in their communities. What do they need? That's human level information that we're very much missing 
at the community level. If you go to Google Maps, you're not even going to see houses in many parts of the island or many parts of the world um, of the most vulnerable communities. And the third piece is that we want to be able to use this crowdsourced community level human intelligence, local information and knowledge and best practices to inform how help is distributed and how we can mobilize residents to be part of the response and recovery process because in so many ways, this is a core of building resilience. Mm -hmm. And lastly, for accountability and adaptability of the, the, the work that communities are doing and, and the philanthropy are doing, we have to help them to report what people have done on the ground much in a much easier way because that's that's sort of the pain in the neck for everyone. So we're trying to tie everything together and elevate communities' voices, make it easier for people who want to help to be able to help and to organize. So that's oh, I love it. The entrepreneurship, the entrepreneurial ferment here is 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 solid. It keeps getting deeper and deeper as we get through. And your name of your organization, what's your website again, Jasmine? So it's re R E means resilience, re plus connect.org. Great. Solid and, and a nice, concise introduction. I, I, I looked at your website a lot, but you just explained it so clearly. Um, Jesse, what, what is the problem that your group's solving? Um, a, little, a little hairy. So I, mean, I, I resonate completely with what, was, what Julia and Jasmine just said, but basically for the past 12, 13 years, uh, we've taken what we call expeditionary entrepreneurship and we send small teams in. You know, we combine special operations, logistics, communications folks, uh, and we go you know, all over the world wherever there's an issue. Um, and our, our niche, you know, has been, we, we identified very early on the disconnect between, you know, aid, top down, these big box solutions, and there being a, a really stark contrast between the true narrative and the real systemic issues and like the ground truth and the issues that the locals are facing versus what all the well-intentioned aid was actually doing. Uh, but it was just kind of a mismatch there. So we basically saw, you know, an entrepreneurial, uh, you know, opportunity, not from a capitalistic or exploitation perspective, but to apply the entrepreneurial tool set to basically go in and be, you know, and identify and empower local capacity. So go in and, you know, who are the local hackers, entrepreneurs, tiny little NGO, you know, folks, just community, you know, leaders, and we would map human terrain, organizational, you know, terrain. And, and because we spoke DOD, NGO, you know, FEMA, UN, whatever the case may be, we were able to kind of take very conventional resources and put them behind, you know, the local stakeholders, which, you know, Julia said, are just always often left outside of the equation. Uh, and empower them to kind of a solve their own problems, you know, create economic stability as, as soon as possible, and then to future proof against uh, occurrences to, you know, so something happens next time to less dependent on the external aid. Uh, and all those lessons, you know, we've learned, we, we've doing the same thing over and over again. And what we're tackling now is, uh, I think, you know, a lot of people in this community are starting to use the terminology, you know, proactive readiness, whole of community. And, you know, the paradigm is shifting from, you know, reactionary response to how do we rejigger how things are funding, how do we you know, examine the culture and, and try to convince people that proactive readiness and mitigation is, is kind of the way to go versus you know, reactionary and recovery. So we're actually working on the least sexy, you know, non-technical element, which is, and actually back domestically uh, at the moment, which is we're, we're trying to socialize readiness. How do we make readiness uh, sexy, cool, acceptable? How do we rebrand it? How do we you know, do what CrossFit has done for fitness and making it communal and tribal? How can we kind of weave this, this skill set, this mindset, this idea of, you know, organizations and, you know, individuals and municipalities being critical last mile infrastructure ahead of something happening. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we are, are tackling this situation. And the last bit is we always focus on, you know, connecting There's a million incredible individuals, uh, organizations, aid organizations, government efforts, military efforts that are really handling a lot of the same things, uh, but everyone's doing it in silo. And our, you know, our role is always to try to just connect the pieces and say, hey guys, this is all awesome. We all need to get around the table uh, and everyone needs to know about everyone else. Solid, Jesse, love it. And actually part of the, the making this, uh, I think sexy with your word and raising awareness is highlighting entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial people who are, are fearless and pioneering their way forward. Large corporates obviously have their role in all this, um, but everyone loves a great entrepreneurial story. Um, and, and I love the, the, the fearless, like you don't even know how this will play out, but you just know that you have to walk in this direction. Solid. Alini, tell us about the, the problem your organization's solving. 
Yeah, it's amazing because I, I feel uh, Julia, Jasmine and Jesse tackled uh, some really interesting points that I was thinking about. So thank you for giving me a good, a good <laughs> segue for, to start work. So what we do is a bit differently. So we, we deploy volunteers and staff to help repair homes that were affected by disasters, especially here in the US. We do that with schools as well, but uh, what I oversee is the US and territories programs. Um, and it's fascinating because you guys are, are totally right. One thing that I've realized, especially in early response, is the disconnect between donations and need. And sometimes we even have an overflow of donations. So I'm really happy that Jasmine, you guys are working on this because that's really a crucial point. Um, and Jesse, to your point as well, one thing that we particularly find it difficult when we hear uh, that a disaster happened, we have to send uh, an assessment team to see if we can help and establish the need. And it's really hard to, to get that information. So uh, yeah, finding ways that we could empower local people to have a way to network that better. Uh, Cause one unfortunate thing is that disasters that have the most media coverage, the one that get more help. Uh, and unfortunately the media coverage fades away after a few new cycles um, and the need is there for many, many years. So yeah, finding that sexiness and keep that alive. It's definitely something that us that do long-term recovery after hurricanes uh, find it very difficult to engage volunteers and donations after after a few months. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Lini. Uh, and Kevin, uh, what's the problem that your organization's solving your, your box of brain? And then thanks everyone for, for teeing up so nicely where I, I found it interesting to hear the term innovation and that innovation comes in many shapes and sizes and it means many different things to different people. Um, and Julia, you're talking about innovation through process. I like that because a lot of times I think people today think you have to develop the new Facebook or Trinket to do something innovative, but actually, you can repackage something and make it available in a way to a population that didn't have it before. Um, and and I, a word I heard a lot as well throughout everyone is mismatch and disconnect. I think that's a common trend where you have people who are trying to trying to chuck a, a square peg down a circle hole, but it's just not the right solution. You have to have that conversation with the grassroots. And what I what we what I believe in is very much a participatory approach and in, in, in looking to build resilience. But one of the big things is that throughout disasters, there is a before, during, short term after, medium term after, long term after rebuild. There's many different stages. And with Box of Rain, it is very much a short term immediate response that it needs to be part of the pre preparation that is then working with organizations like a Tactivate, like a All Hands and Hearts, like all these organizations that are actually on the ground providing the distribution. So Box of Rain, we work with different corporate partners and different nonprofit entities to ultimately prepare and store water and then work, uh, you know, for example, a use case was we work with Good360 in All Hands and Hearts to deploy water after a hurricane that happened this past fall um, to make sure water was available to those in need. But we know that water is just a piece of the puzzle. Sometimes water is actually not needed. Sometimes there's actually plenty of water, um, but they need food or they need tents, they need light. So that's where we are a service to nonprofits and to businesses that want to support nonprofits and uh, specifically focus around providing safe water. And I think one of the biggest things that, that I believe in, and I'm sure everyone else is that we need to continue to make those dollars go to work. Dollars need to be put into impact and action. Dollars can't just be for flaunting and looking good and feeling good. And I think that, that means we need a bigger, wider approach of people that are involved and knowing that sometimes it's mapping, sometimes it's data, sometimes it's water, sometimes it's food. And we're just a piece of the puzzle focused on empowering those who are in need of safe water and whatever we can do and whoever wants to help and put their dollars in action. That's what we strive to do. Cool. Thanks, Kevin. So I just want to come back to you, Kevin. So aren't, aren't, aren't people already delivering safe water to, to disaster and emergency sites? What are you doing differently than the incumbent water solution? Uh, sometimes, yes, there are groups, but at the same time, depending on the situation, it's not enough. Uh, particularly with, with Box or Rain, we have a, a particular technology uh, called Bag and Box. So if, if any of you remember uh, the Frontia slap the bag wine in the box, we have a water in the box. So we're able to distribute and, and deliver about 85% or the same amount of water using 85% less plastic, 
Uh, we've actually worked with the U.S. Army with this particular technology as well because they like to drop it out of the planes and it has less breakage rate than bottled water. So there's still the need in some regards for these one-time use dis distributed plastic containers, but we're doing it more efficiently and effectively. There's also the means to make it reusable and reuse, um, uh, reusable in different ways. Um, and I think the other way of, again, like as Jasmine at, or um, I believe, uh, Julia had mentioned, it's innovation through process. We are making water more widely accessible and available, working with profits to make it available uh, immediately. They don't need it a week from now, they need it right now um, when the disaster happens. So making, make, making sure that it's available, distributed, and accessible to those in need when the disaster actually happens. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Kevin. I want to switch the conversation a little bit to partnerships. I mean, one man band, you can't do this on your own. None of your organizations can work without partners. What, what's your uh, one or two secrets to success in making partnerships work? Jesse, I want to come back to you because you work with tons of partners. What do you find is the most effective way to, to realize the potential of partnerships? Yeah, I mean, so we have kind of a maxim, like there's no truth for the capital T, right? Every organizational approach, whether it's government, NGO, private sector, everyone has their own SOPs and cultural biases and perspectives, and there's not necessarily right, wrong, or otherwise, it just is. And in these types of environments, you have to see the positive in everything and the capacity and capability of each resource community. And the challenge uh, has been, at least in our experience, that the, the existing constructs uh, don't necessarily allow for all stakeholders to have a voice, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so at least we, the way, one way we've tried to tackle that is, and I think Rich, who was, you, you'd called that earlier, I, I think they, they would resonate to this. There's a lot of power in physical proximity. Um, you know, the AI and these, these, these connect, you know, all, all these technical platforms are amazing, but, you know, both before something happens and in a disaster, in order to bridge those, those, those divides organizationally, culturally, um, you have to have people together. You have to bring people face to face. And that's very hard to do, uh, with the status quo. Um, so the way, the way we've done it is we literally, you know, as unsexy as it is, I keep using that term, but we, we stand up, what we call team houses, right? We create a little physical location, whether it's a tent or whatever, and we go out and we find, you know, the finger painter, the bike builder, whoever the local, you know, power broker might be. And we, you know, grab someone from the government, we grab someone from the military, we grab the helicopter pilot, we grab someone from the 82nd Airborne, whatever. You know, and we say, hey, you guys need to know each other, right? And when people sit around and have a beer and say, oh, you know, I'm military, but you're NGO, you're not half bad. Oh, oh, you're the local kid that happens to have all this information that the government's trying to source, oh, but you've already got it and you're 16 years old. Well, that's amazing. Um, so we just put people together. I know it's, you know, it's not a novel concept, but it, it seemed to have worked, uh, you know, very well, both, you know, and we try to really do that proactively before a disaster happens. Um, we saw a lot of that, you know, as a result, a lot of the inefficiencies with COVID and, you know, people trying to help but don't understand supply chains and how hospitals work and, and our, our, our kind of theory of change or philosophy is if you can get people together before something happens, they can understand how things actually work and you can establish informal relationships that connectivity exists when something actually happens and that human connection exists. Uh, it might help to make things work a little bit more effectively and efficiently. Got it. Got it. Julia, I want to come back to you. Um, one of the questions in the chat thing was about customers and target clients. And it, it is kind of a partnership. You're selling the municipalities, which has got to be one of the hardest things in the world to do. What is your secret to getting the attention of a municipality and and and, and partnering with them to bring your offerings to to to, yeah. to bear? It was an interesting question. So we found a back door, frankly. <laughs> um, we actually sell to engineering firms who are selling to municipalities. Okay. So both in every public process for a public infrastructure project, um, you have to engage with the public. One of our innovations is taking the engagement process and the data validation and modeling process and packaging them together. Mm -hmm. um, so I can go to an engineering firm and being like, hey, you need to validate that, you know, your model for flooding in this neighborhood, we will provide the validation data, you know, and we can go in that door or we can be a part of their engagement process. Mm. Same with municipalities. So, you know, if, you know, most of the time a municipality is budget constrained and they are risk averse. Mm -hmm. So if they don't have an easy way to, for me to get into an RFP, uh, I can subcontract with some of the engineering firms who are, you know, dedicated to doing the modeling work. And that's a, a win for them because we actually improve the, the models 
and we're helping them with their design and we are getting them the, the points they need on public trust and engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually our primary client. And actually in terms of engineering firms, it is a very large market. Um, you have small and medium engineering firms, like 140,000 of them in the US alone. Um, that you can sell these for you know services as a subscription to. But the municipalities, once you do land that client, and it's a little bit of a longer term game, once they sign you in or bring you in and you become a part of a process and you're trusted, they're a lot more um, hesitant to leave you. Actually, you can kind of stay in as a long-term contract. So that's how we've handled that market in particular. But we're really excited also about the utility of our product for uh, utilities, you know, who are maintaining water lines, sewer lines. Um, managing drought and flood cycles, um, you know, electricity utilities, small ones uh, who are dealing with energy efficiency and heat and urban heat risks mm -hmm. um, or downing of wires. And that, again, those are great opportunities for us to be exploring in 2021. But basically, we think of climate change as a long term emergency that is punctuated by all the events that all, all of you all have been responding to. And it's that long term engagement and, and trust and data collection that you need as part of this process to be able to service, you know, mitigation, which is if you spend $1 on, on disaster mitigation, you're going to save $6 in, you know, at long term. It's an incredible cost benefit if you really, you know, make a community more resilient with that long term planning and infrastructure. Thanks. And what's the mask on the wall behind you? <laughs> uh, it's an Indonesian mask uh, from Sumatra. Uh, my background before I started, I see, before I became a climate reporter and I covered the hurricane Katrina and Asian tsunami in the same year, a long time ago, um, I was an anthropologist. Um, and that's uh, like my passion actually was understanding. And that was the first thing you learn in, in, in anthropology is that the environment creates the people, creates the culture and the structures. So when the environment changes, everything changes. So that is like fundamental to the thesis of IC change. Well, one of the things, that, the good segue to Jasmine, sorry to cut you off, but I wanted to keep okay. the uh, train moving here because we have limited time, but I want to segue over to Jasmine and, and planning. I mean, based on your anthropology background, people live in harm's way. And I ask myself, why? I mean, and so is there some is there some way with your anthropology background that you and Jasmine could help communities come up with a plan so that people don't live in harm's way? Jasmine, what is, what is your approach to researching and recommending longer term solutions that, that might require people to move? Do you guys get into that stuff? Well, okay, I, I think it's a very complicated thing about moving, and mm -hmm. and I don't think any of us is in the place of saying anybody should be moving or not moving. Um, but in terms of connecting and partnership, and what we are really our core is about connection. So our goal is to connect residents with community grassroots organizations and donors. I mean, everyone wants to help. But right now it's very difficult for people to be connecting and, and exactly like what Jesse was saying, that there are functional and resource and structural and institutional and social barriers why people are not connecting and talking to each other at this time. And what some over the past year, I mean, both personally and learning from an anthropological perspective and reading stories from around the world and over history is in terms of building resilience is that you're more, most likely to be helped or helping your neighbors and friends and family more than that you're gonna wait for the firefighter or a, a, a professional first responder to come. For some communities in Puerto Rico, they didn't see any government people for months. And that you, you and also during the pandemic, you probably have seen that in the United States, the wealthiest country in the world, but when you have elderly people that needs groceries being delivered and being cared for and get checked on, you need your friends and neighbors and, and connections. And that's the kind of core, what, what, what we're talking about, the core of resilience is to be able to connect with each other. And the social capital that we're seeing is how you're going to be able to find information about should I be moving or not? If that's a topic that you're interested in, right? Like, do I, um, how do I apply for government funding? How do I get my, um, I don't know, uh, government um, support? Like if you don't even know how to do that. So we're, we're trying to kind of catalyze that kind of connection and to build a, a lot of the times in places like Puerto Rico, there's also this just mental health and, uh, 
challenge that that you need company, you need connection. And, and now everyone in the world now realize more than ever the importance of connection and support for each other. Um, and, and also this kind of bonding and communities being made to, to band together is also the source of fighting for their own rights and asking and, and fighting for what's deserved of them from places and where they should be able to access the kind of resources that, that they need to access. So we see really the, 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 the ability and empower to connect people as the core of, and be able to make decisions that's not just being pushed away. There's so much research about disaster that, again, exactly like Julia said of who's sitting at the table. Right now, it's really white engineers that are sitting at the table making decisions and not residents, not other people. And sometimes they're being pushed to move when they don't feel like moving. And there's a lot of reasons why people do not want to be moving. And, and, and our own, going to a more philosophical level of our relationship with places are very, are very personal. Are, 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 there's so many different reasons why we live and choose to live in certain places. And I'm an immigrant and I, I, I realize, you know, this the huge, um, I know that the kind of the pain I've I've have to come to to live with because of the certain choices I've made to come to the U.S. So I'm going to stop there. Well, thanks for that. I like that. I mean, your name is is connection. I mean, that's and your company's name is connection. So that's that's a needed uh, area of help. Uh, Alini, I want to um, switch over to you. And so you mentioned in your opening remarks that you're helping rebuild homes. Is that, is that a decision the organization made because of um, your corporate support? Or is that something that you started with that as a vision and then you were able to attract corporate partners to, to donate towards that vision? Tell us a little bit about how you arrived at that particular uh, issue. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's just our niche. Uh, one thing you have to find your niche. There's so many problems and to Kevin's point, it takes the village. So I think you have to find your strengths and then find partnerships that leverage the work that you're doing to help communities. Uh, but now it's interesting. We actually started in Indonesia. So it's funny that uh, Julia was there. That was when our founders started the organization 15 years ago. And initially it was just getting people to help people. It was as simple as that, just to come uh, volunteer and just help as much as needed, uh, asking people what they need and then building boats. It was literally like anything. And I think as we grew as an organization, it became more organized, we saw that we have a really strong um, leverage in the home rebuild and school rebuild part of the disaster relief setting. So um, I think it was just like organically, we just migrated to this and have been doing that for more than a decade. Um, yeah. and, and so most of your work is domestic US or all over the world or where, where, how do you break it down percentage wise? So all of the world, uh, the, the part that I oversee is the US, but I have a, a, a pair that oversees international recovery. Uh, the US, we focus more on homes and internationally we focus more on schools, uh, okay. permittings and everything that it, the US is more complex to do schools, ground up construction. Uh, so yeah, we focus more on homes here. Cool. Thanks, Alini. And so Kevin, um, so so box, so containerized water. So I need water. I, actually, it's a hurricane. There's water everywhere, but it's contaminated. I just need safe water. And so a truck comes up with boxes of water. How does, how how do I receive as a homeowner? I'm thirsty. I need hygiene. I need to cook. What I get a box. How much does it weigh? And and what happens? You know, how does it how does it get to me? And as you've heard from this conversation so far, is that. Unfortunately, disasters are not black and white. Everything is a little bit different um, from the geographies that we're encountering from North America to West Africa to Asia. Every, geographies are completely different. Um, and and I uh, shout out Julia as well. I was a, I'm a human geography guy at heart and, and love the whole dynamic of people, place and space and time and all that. Um, but I think with looking at logistics, logistics is the hardest part of this whole story. I mean, uh, you could have the best thing in the world, but if it's sitting in a warehouse collecting dust, it doesn't mean anything to me. Mm -hmm. So for us, we we are a network of partners. And the way that we, we do this, I and mean, we have a manufacturing plant in Dallas, Texas, and different warehousing capabilities. Wait, uh, Kevin, when you say manufacturing, what are you manufacturing? Just uh, we're, uh, we are taking dirty water or you know municipal water and turning it into packaged, safe, containerized water palletizing this and we have 75 units 75 2.64 gallon boxes on one pallet 
and often we ship by the container load just because we're not quite Pepsi or Coca-Cola and, and selling on 7-Eleven shelves. We have economies of scale when we, sh we ship and deliver by pallets and trailer loads. So we often will ship by a full trailer load, which is somewhere between 24 and 26 pallets. Um, so up, upwards of close to around um, just under 30,000 uh, gallons or so when we can deliver uh, a trailer of water. But for example, when we worked with all hands and all hearts earlier this year, it was we we don't we did not have the people on the ground. So, but all hands and all hearts did, and so that was something where we were able to get the water to their receiving hub, and by with their volunteers on the ground distributing it to those in need. And again, this was just water. There was many things that are needed before, during, and after disasters. And I think a lot of this continues to come back to the disaster preparation and. Uh, Jesse had mentioned this as well. Disasters aren't sexy. Uh, most people don't really think about it, but all we all know disasters, man-made and in, in that and in, in the natural, are like baseball season. We know they're going to happen. Yet we often still are just very reactive and to, to the whole approach. But we but I, another one I heard was the whole investing one dollar to save three or four dollars. It's unfortunately hard to conceptualize that. Most people still just think about today. Uh, thinking about just what, what's in front of me now. So what we're continuing to try and strive for is, it, is pre-positioning, pre-deployment, and, and just being able to alleviate the short to medium term disasters with access to the most simple basic need, water, with a, a solution that's very ergonomic. Um, and, and I think a big thing that we look at too is that you don't just need water for drinking, you need water for cooking, you need water for cleaning, you need water for hygiene, and if you do not have the means of producing it on the spot, our container with the 2.64 gallons and the, the spigot allows you to easily use it for other uses that besides just drinking. Um, so we, that's a that's a big, big yeah, kind of intrinsic value to our to our technology. And again, uh, I think just back to your last point, John, of how does it get there? We are actively looking for more local and international partners that have the means of receiving and distributing. Now we do have quite a bit of shipping capabilities, but we're, you know, I'm one guy in Chicago. I, we, we are all, all looking for local nonprofits that have needs and we can continue to support those needs with um, the proper resources, particularly safe water. Cool, thanks, Kevin. Just a simple entrepreneur in Chicago, just a simple person. Just a guy. Um, so, all right, we're about a little over halfway through this discussion. I want to switch uh, over a little bit to challenges and problems and, and talk a little bit about what are some headwinds that we're all seeing in this space. It's just, you know, other social impact and environmental stuff has a colleague who's a, a certain race or gender or orientation and they're in the company and they're there and you can see them. Disasters happen to other people far away. And so there's a competition for dollars within companies and they don't always make it to people far away because you have colleagues who are representing different worthwhile causes. How does disaster and resiliency overcome this? It happens to other, other people thing. Um, Jasmine, I wanna come back to you about how do you, how, how have you found uh, some of the challenges? What are the, like, the two or three big challenges you face and how have you overcome them? Um, I would say, so first of all, I think everyone probably experienced this in the humanitarian space. It's not like any other innovation that you can, you know, break it and do it fast and let's just try things out and see if it works or not. There are a very deep and broad set of principal standards and procedures that majorly do no harm, right? Like to, to the people that we're working with. And there's very high accountability requirements and there's limited amount of resources to meet the growing challenges, but money that can come for innovation, quote unquote, but they're the money that also really needed to just feed the people and water and shelter and all that. So we have to be very, very careful in terms of how we are using resources to do innovation. And, and unfortunately, that there's a lot of times that there's some good, but not good enough solution out there that doesn't meet the, the, cannot scale. And then you're kind of in an awkward space of, so what do we do about that? So we definitely want to be very, very careful about how we do innovation. And, and what we are trying to do is that 
the research phase is very long. Like I spend a lot of time on the ground and I am an all hands and hearts volunteer. I was in Chapacoa. I was learning with the volunteers, with the residents and spending time on the ground. I spent so much, I, I go to Puerto Rico whenever I can. And, and, and now we are in the piloting phase. We meet with our users every other week and we share with them they're in our design process the whole time so we know we're building something that they will absolutely use and also we're very careful about you know the existing challenges why things are not working like for example the you know as i mentioned the social and institutional resource barriers there there is of what people consider to be good data and useful information sometimes people don't acknowledge that the local knowledge and information that's out there. And we can't just like put it out there, be like, hey, we got data from this neighborhood and, and you got to use it. We, we can't just say that. So we have to be very intentional about building technology and data use protocol with all the stakeholders that are going to be in the system. And um, yeah, I, I guess overall, it's just important to be humble and see who we are. We're facilitators. We're not the know-it-all. And we're building this with, um, the, the users and we always apply for funding together with our users so they are well acknowledged and, and compensated for for their knowledge and time in the in the development process mm -hmm. um so yeah overall just you know see them as the expert and that we're learning with them we're taking the time um to do this so we're not wasting time and do no harm that's the most important Great, thanks, thanks, Jasmine. Jesse, I want to switch over to you. What What are some headwinds you face? I know every site, every disaster is a little different, but generally, what are some of the big headwinds, category, categorically speaking? Uh, I think it's systemically, and a drum we've been beating for a long time is there's the, the missing, you know, gap or the, the DNA and this whole, you know, humanitarian assistance, disaster response ecosystem. I think is entrepreneurship, right? And there's there's a very specific structure for how things work. And either you're a for profit, or you're a disaster capitalist, or you're an NGO, or you're government or your DOD, and you know, I think a lot of people have expressed this, there's a big room for informal actors, right? Informal capacity, the people you're actually there to help, right? And, and a lot of times, and I forget who said it, but the narrative is also you know, often misconstrued. And that's not necessarily malicious. It's hard to get at the bottom of, of the true in, you know, inherent challenges in every respective disaster. It's very difficult. And entrepreneurs happen to be really good at that, right? And just as corporate social responsibility has evolved over the years and we started you know, the one-for-one -one model and then we realized what didn't work about that and you know, things have kind of changed, we really think that there's huge space for the entrepreneurial mindset, toolkit, perspective, in this world, right? And that's not necessarily to say, hey, let's drop in, start a business and capitalize on, you know, disaster capitalism. It's, you know, how do we in a sustainable way empower, train, you know, entrepreneurs to be deployable, to speak this language, to be able to embed with and help NGOs, private companies, military make those connections. Because guess what? You know, solving a problem in a disaster, especially, you know, looking at all of the cultural biases and ingrained systems that are keeping our society and other societies from being proactively ready because there's such a sense of dependence and, you know, reactionary and all, and that's how all of these, you know, resource bases are, are currently established. That's an entrepreneurial challenge, right? That's a huge opportunity, uh, but it's really difficult. You know, if we have intentionally not become an NGO, our life would be a lot easier, but we really wanted as cliche and as millennial as it is, business can be used for good, right? But a lot of times, a lot of NGOs, you know, spend a lot of time begging for money and fundraising as opposed to executing on the mission. Whereas if you're a for-profit and you go and you make some money and you do what you want with those funds and you can self-sustain and self-support. Uh, but there, you know, when you drop into these disasters and you're an entrepreneur and like you don't affiliate intentionally so you can be unbiased and you can, you know, be a chameleon and, and you, know, tr you know, cross over all these parallels. The FEMA guys don't know what to make of you. The UN log cluster doesn't know what to make of you. The military can't quite place you. Uh, and that's an asset if you know how to play it. But at the end of the day, I think there's absolutely massive, massive opportunity and a need to define, you know, a... A, a an entrepreneurial role, <laughs> you know. Jesse, I don't wanna... Jesse, just quickly, what are the different entrepreneurial um, personalities or, or backgrounds needed on the ground? Is it possible to say we need an entrepreneur that is this skill set, that one? What are like the big five entrepreneurial types that would be really helpful? You know, I think I think it's a curriculum issue in the states. I think there's a, there's a room for attract educate people on you know the, the humanitarian ecosystem. What happens in disasters? You know. Okay. It's, it's a, a sociocultural, you know, social, social movement theory, you know, all of these things that apply to actual disaster response. Um, but, you know, the types, the eco, you know, the, the personality types, look, you need people who are, you know, really empathetic, 
don't have egos, um, you know, that have, have to be trained to operate in, you know, incredibly austere environments. You know, they need to learn how to actually, you know, be able to, to function in, the, in these realms. And then you've got to educate them on the different, you know, languages and, and you know, types of personalities and organizational constructs of all the players that are involved. And that's incredibly diverse from, you know, the local culture to, you know, government to military to, you know, all the political players, the funding, you know, funding personalities. Um, they have to become fluent in this so they can kind of embed and work with and connect across resource communities. Got it. I think just to answer my own question, I think what would, with the buckets would be somebody who's really good with building and construction entrepreneur, somebody who's really good with water, wastewater entrepreneur, somebody who's really good with telecom connectivity entrepreneur who maybe spent time in Verizon or something like that and wants to do something entrepreneurial. I think somebody who's good with logistics entrepreneur, they've spent years at UPS or whatever and like I want to help out. And somebody who's good at, at um, at, uh, at, at cultural uh, communication, connectivity, and making sure that the culture is, is communicated or broader. Like, I think that getting an environment, uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem with different subject matter expertise is, is yep. interesting. Uh, Julia, getting back to you on, 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 your, um, on your business, what are some of the headwinds, like what are the big one or two headwinds you face day in, day out? Um, with, with your, uh, the, uh, I'm happy to answer that and try and touch on a few things. I think that in terms of challenges that I faced or headwinds, if you will, um, you know, I actually don't live in Chicago, Boston, or San Francisco. I live at zero sea level, and I live in a state that had seven hurricanes hit my way. BP oil spill, coastal erosion. I live the disaster zone every year. And that is where all the innovation comes from. However, does that make me accessible to capital? So my co-founder is based in Boston. So we, at, we list Boston as also a place that we're located because that is access to capital. What kind of capital? <laughs> we're rating, raising our first seed round this year. We have, financial capital. Yeah, financial capital, like money. <laughs> it's a, what about intellectual capital and human capital? Human capital is huge. I mean, having networks to access better resources to scale partnerships. Um, so again, your location really matters in terms of the connections and partners you can bring in. Now, I've been able to like, you know, fly around the world and generate partners and, and things like that. And I'm really good at that. But that means, but I'm a select like, group that's able to like translate um, local needs as well as speak business language or speak, you know, capital language. I'm, I'm able, I'm, I'm, I'm multiracial and big, you know, I have this kind of code switch in my DNA. But most people who are living close to these disasters have the answers and they don't necessarily want to be at the whim of other people flying in to provide them with resources. They would much rather have those innovations at hand because they know themselves real well. And we will to like figure out systems where those and invest in those places and, and give those folks the, the resources they need to be resilient. Um, and New Orleans, Louisiana, any frontline community can experience that. So in terms, I mean, I'm, I'm a female entrepreneur of color based in New Orleans, taking on climate change. Those are my headwinds, but boy, this year, climate tech was blowing up. Um, our billion disaster, dollar disasters are blowing up in terms of people understanding that this is everyone's risk and there's nowhere to run. We're getting so much interest from California, like coders are saying, I don't really even care how much I make because I suddenly woke up and realized that this is now, it's now. Um, so the headwinds have been hard, but maybe this is the year that we will. Thanks, uh, Julia. Alini, um, what, are, what are some of your high-level uh, high goals this year? As a nonprofit organization, you have to announce your sort of objectives. What are one or two things that you want to accomplish this year that would be interesting to the audience? Operate a residential model in a COVID environment has been really interesting. Uh, that has been, <laughs> uh, and Jasmine, really nice that you've been in your call with us. That's our strong suit. Like we just have an international hostel that does disaster relief. That's how I translate all hands to people that haven't done volunteering with us. And yeah, that has been challenging. Um, trying to operate safely in a pandemic has been hard. Uh, but I think overall the main challenge, and I, I, I said it before, uh, but I just wanna make sure that I have like a really strong capture on that one. It's really long-term funds. Um, so yeah, educating people on that communities take like years and sometimes even a decade or decades to recover after disaster, it's really important. Like we're still doing work in Harvey in Texas and people probably forgot about Harvey. Um, like New Orleans, yeah, there's still homes from Katrina. So 
I think that's really crucial for people, people here on the call to understand that just because the media coverage went away, there's still need on the ground and yeah, just keep pushing that message. Uh, Kevin, some of the disasters that are around us are chronic, like Flint. Could that be considered a disaster? Very much so. And, and I think that was when, when I was thinking about Flint earlier in the conversation, sometimes disasters happen and, and we're forced to move because water is encroaching on us and, and we have to move. Uh, Flint's an interesting story where a lot of times people ask the families in Flint, why don't you just move? It's a little bit easier said than done. You've got a mortgage, you've got a family, you've got attachment to a particular space and place. And, and Flint is, is a culmination of mistakes that is a man-made cause disaster. They talk about how the, the water and municipality talks about how the water is safe to drink. Even if it is, it doesn't matter. It's more the trust. And so now it's just a matter of rebuilding trust. And, and I think Flint's a good example, unfortunately, of a, an example of that disasters come in many shapes and sizes. And the, the need in Flint is, is, is to rebuild trust and is to provide medium and long-term solutions. But even until that point, providing short-term water relief. And, and we've, we did that this year. We, we contributed upwards of seven different trailer loads of water for families to, to get them through the April to May when there was so much uncertainty around COVID. There was just the dynamic, which was terrible, is wash your hands with lead, lead tainted water or don't wash your hands and, and risk getting COVID. And granted, we're learning more about this, but it was just to even be in that situation and have to ask yourself that question it, as a mom of, with, with kids, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible reality. Um, but uh, one thing I wanted to, to come back to as well, and all the entrepreneurs have talked about here is disrupting the status quo. I think one thing that I really like is that, or the phrase that actually I hate and keeps me up at night is when people say, oh, this is just the way it's always been. And in my mind, I'm like, like since the dinosaurs, like since the cavemen, like maybe for like 30 years, 50 years, that's the way it's been. But that's just because it's the way that you do it now, it doesn't mean it's the right way. And I think we need to continue to question ourselves. And an another kind of philosophy I live by is the whole freakonomics, think like a freak, think like a kid, and just ask why. Why are you doing it that way? Uh, maybe we could do it better. And, and I do think that there's the need for nonprofits and charities. Um, but at the same time, I think we need to continue to look at building resilience. Um, in, in my opinion, the point of a nonprofit is to not exist anymore. You want to ultimately build that empowerment to allow for resilience. Um, but at the same time, there's a need for multiple partners um, to be able to get stuff done. And, and I think to, to Jesse's point that he brought up was just the lack of education. So stuff like this is super valuable just to, to learn that this is not a cut and dry situation, but there's a lot of challenges that exist that need innovation and need disruption. Um, and, and frankly, I love all that, want all that. I'm, I'm very focused on water and impact, but everyone else on this call, it's, it's great to hear from you. So if, if you're listening and you're out there, um, this is a great group of people to reach out to, to just kick the can around with, because there's a lot of, a lot of passion and energy in here that I know can be used to deploy a lot of good for those in need during and after disasters. Well, Kevin, to echo that, entrepreneurs have that hustle. Ear to the ground, working on Saturdays, working on Sundays. Corporates, they help in their own way, but there's just sometimes less hustle and less sort of um, on the ground um, understanding what's going on. All right, go around one more time just for, um, start with you, Jasmine. If, if, if you could talk to the universe and, and, and ask for one thing to come your way, and let's say the universe is on the other end of this call, what would be the one thing that would be really helpful this year for, for you? For me personally or for the world? Uh, for your organization. Um, connection. To? Put it out there to, you know, for us to learn about what you're doing out there, community groups willing to try and, um, and and to try our and for us to learn from them and um we're always looking for talents to join our group um and funding is always something that we're looking out for but overall we just hope people can connect with each other and learn from each other and care for each other so well maybe uh, maybe on this call that there's some communities out there that that julia or lini or, or jesse knows about that could 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 leverage your group's capabilities um Jesse, what's, what's one thing that, that, that you'd like to come your way um, this year? I know that's a huge question, but like, 
Um, you know, I think if we can just finally crack the nut on, on, you know, if we can decrease the need, quite frankly, for all of us on this call uh, and, and help, you know, expose folks to, you know, acquiring this perspective instead of skills, um, make me happy. Julia, what's one thing you, you hope will come your way this year? Oh, wow. Um, well, I know we're going to raise our funds, so that's our, our round or whatever. That's not a problem. But I would love channel partners, like really amazing people like you guys. Like Box of Rain, Read Connect, Activate, Hands and Hearts. We, we are channel partners. We can all help each other with, with what we're doing. And then being able to do that at scale with some larger, larger organizations and enterprise clients. Mm -hmm. this year. Alini, what's, what's one thing that you'd like to come your way this year? One thing, I want so many things, like, like I want a vaccine so we can operate safely. I want funds because I'm a nonprofit, like, give me the money, please. Like, we need money to operate. Uh, volunteers, we need the bodies. So, I'm sorry, I couldn't pick one. I, I was greedy. <laughs> Those are all good ones. Tevin, what's one thing that, that is uh, that you'd like to come your way this year? I guess, like, Alina, besides a barrel of money, which which always helps move the, move the needle in certain ways, um, I, I think just continuing openness to partnership and I think acceptance that uh, coronavirus is, is, uh, is here to stay, um, even with vaccines, everything. We're in the new normal, so it's just embracing the new normal, and, and, but through that is embracing partnerships. I don't think we all, we all know we, we can't do it all, so we need stronger partnerships. And so I would, I would just, I'm looking for more nonprofit and corporate partnerships that want to do good. And that means a lot of things, to a lot of people, but through everyone on this call and, and you, John, there's a lot that we can do to pay it forward and do good without being snake oil salesmen. You know, we can do it the right way and help others. And I'm confident through good partnerships, we can, we can accomplish that. You know, it might be fun to do this uh, format quarterly or maybe uh, at least twice a year to get um, additional entrepreneurs and just get some cadence around um, fearless pioneers who are going about this and just getting an ecosystem going of people. Like I said before, Jesse, you, I guess I answered my own question about getting somebody who's a rock star in you know, bridge repair and somebody who's a crop person to help people get the crops back up and running again, or maybe people that the cell phone towers down, like just a, a, like a, a, a series of black belts that all of us can rely on for different problems. But it's, it's sort of, I think somebody in the discussion group said, hack, I think hack is the right word. We need to hack some of these incumbent compl complacent solutions and bring in new ideas that are, that are new and challenging, but it comes to entrepreneurship. So that brings us to the end of, end of the hour. Uh, it went by so quick. But... I just wanna say yes and to that before we can. I mean, sure. so climate tech is so focused on GHG and, and, it, and it's critical. We need to do adaptation and mitigation at the same time. So really developing the community for adaptation tech, resilience tech, mm. innovation and entrepreneurship. I'm in, you, you tell, I'm happy to help. Adaptation tech. That's yeah. the first time I've heard that word, adaptation tech. Yeah. Welcome to my world. Come on, let's make it happen. So it, it's basically assuming that, that we've got a future that is going to be wetter and hotter and, and, and connected. I mean, and so, climate tech has been, it has been developing just this year in a way that it needed it to 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I'm saying right now, we, we have to do both at the same time with the resources we have. We need to adapt and mitigate and be really, really strategic and smart about it because it's, it's happening way faster than all the models predict and everyone's been a lot slower to act. Well, I think that this has been, a, I've learned a lot from, from the five of you. I think we should do this again and I'll invite you again and next time you'll be in the audience, but nevertheless, you can use the chat function to come in and, and, and let's just get some community and some camaraderie going here and it can lead to all kinds of good things. So um, audience, thanks for uh, participating and uh, this will be recorded. And, and emailed out to everybody so you can watch it again um, if you missed a few things. Have a great uh, afternoon. Thanks to our participants uh, for taking the time and um, see everyone soon.